All right. If you have your Bibles, if you turn back to Colossians chapter 1 with me. We'll just hit the ground running. Um, just a reminder to remember and be in prayer for the young couples that uh, Brother Jono is doing premarital counseling with on Wednesday nights. And um, as a reminder, we're going to be in Colossians 1, 24 through 2, 5. We should finish up that section tonight, pending any calamity. Um, the title of this last section, I uh, entitled The Hope of Glory and the Local Church. Now, if you remember, we've... We've looked at the joy and suffering. We've looked at Paul's tribulation in verse 24. We've seen him as a servant, a steward, and a preacher in 25, his occupation. So we've seen tribulation and occupation. Tonight we'll look at Paul's proclamation and his motivation. And the more that I've studied this, I, the more I think that motivation may not be the best word, but I've kind of painted myself into a corner for about three weeks, so we're just going to roll with it. So with all that said, I'm going to read once again Colossians 1, 24 through 2, 5. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Of this church I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit, so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. That is, the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but has now been manifested to his saints, to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom, so that we may present every man complete in Christ. For this purpose also I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have on your behalf and for those who are at Laodicea, and for all those who have not personally seen my face, that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love, and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery, that is, Christ himself, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this so no one will delude you with persuasive argument. For even though I am absent in body, Nevertheless, I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good discipline and the stability of your faith in Christ. Let's pray. Lord, as we approach this section of your word one last time, would I pray that you would help us as we look at this passage, this section of passages, that you would help us to See the clear message of the gospel, that which Paul says that he proclaims, that mystery that was long ago hidden but has been revealed in Christ. Lord, we just pray that you would help us to see that clearly. That you, we would understand the hope of glory and its implications for the local church. And Lord, we ask all of this in Christ's name. Amen. It's... It's one thing, as we talked a few weeks ago about Paul's tribulation, his suffering, it's one thing to pay a price for a message, to be willing to be a servant of that message, to steward that message, to proclaim that message. But as we get to where we've come to in the passage, we have to ask, is that message both clear and biblical? Is the motivation biblical? Because we can talk about suffering for the gospel and we can, we can talk about our, our occupation, our place of, of work within the church or within the furtherance of such a message. But if we do all the practical application, if we do all the study, if we put forward all the effort, we pay all the cost, humbly serve, and yet miss Christ as the sinner... 
if we miss the gospel as foundational, what is being a servant? A servant of what? A steward of what? A, a preacher of what? Now, it's, it's one thing to, to talk about those that carry a message. There are plenty of people that carry a message. But the, me the message, if it's not biblical, if it's not of a biblical Christ, then what is it that we what is it that we're carrying? So that's what we ask as we we look at Paul's proclamation picking up in verse 26. What is it? It is 26 through 28. That is the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations but has now been manifested to his saints, to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom. So let's ask the question first, what was the mystery? This mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of of glory. Ephesians 3 tells us that, that Paul writes, by referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. To be specific, so the mystery that he's revealing that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. So his mystery that he talks about here is not the secret hitting knowledge of the Gnostic. It's not the right understanding of the law of the Judaizers. It's not the right understanding of some freewheeling grace of the hedonist. But finally, in Christ, we see the promise that was made to Abraham in 20, Genesis twenty two eighteen 18 come to pass. When God told him, in you, through your seed, through your offspring, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. When we see that carried forth into the New Testament in Genesis three sixteen, Genesis three sixteen, Galatians three sixteen. there's not a Genesis in the New Testament. That maybe that's the message translation. <laughs> now the promises which were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. And he does, not, he does not say and to seeds as referring to many, but rather to one. And your seed, that is Christ. So when we, we look for the mystery, when we look to say what is this mystery that God has revealed, we look no further than the person of Christ. Some come, and, and I've experienced this much in my background, some come and offer a fresh word. Some hidden insight that God has revealed only to them. Or some offer a reduced gospel without the cross. Some offer a gospel where the cross is overshadowed by man-centered steps and practices. Just as in Colossae, we're offered a better way. A better message, a better approach. But Paul writes to a church that's being bombarded by those offering a better road. And he prints, presents to them a true redeemer. Rather than some better path, rather than, well, yeah, the, the gospel that Paul preaches is pretty close, but let us offer something else. Because as you remember, he's already went through and said, by him and for him was everything made. Nothing was made without him. He created all things. He sustains all things. He upholds all things. He's over all things. And it is in that Christ that the mystery of the Old Testament prophecy, the mystery of the salvation that was to come, is revealed. So then we ask the question, as he said, this mystery which was hidden from past ages and generations, but has now been manifested, has been made known among the saints. So we ask two things. How was it hidden? And then how was it revealed? Let's work through just a few of the messianic prophecies of the Old Testament. 
A virgin shall conceive, and you shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. Isaiah 7, 14. The government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. It's simple enough for us to look on this side of the incarnation. Many, if not most, fully understand what it is about Christ coming to earth. We might throw around terms like the hypostatic union. We may talk about fully God and fully man. It's easy enough for us to see that in light of the New Testament. But you live in the day of Isaiah and say a virgin gives birth? We'll call him God with us. He'll be born of a woman and yet we'll call him mighty God, eternal father. He'll reign on the throne of David forever. Then we think again, as we've said, all the nations of the earth will be blessed in him. And we, yet we see those in the Old Testament like Abraham who believed God and it was accounted to them as righteousness. So they have all of this to take in, all of this mystery to take in. They know the promise of a Redeemer is coming. And they think He'll reign on the throne of David forever. He will be God with us. And then Isaiah gets to chapter 53. Picking up in verse 3. He was despised and abandoned by men. A man of great pain and familiar with sickness. And like one from whom people hid their faces. He was despised and we had no regard for him. The we who awaited him. The we who looked forward to his coming. However, it was our sickness that he himself bore. And our pains that he carried. Yet we ourselves assume that he had been afflicted, struck down by God and humiliated. But he was pierced for our offenses. He was crushed for our wrongdoings. The punishment for our well-being was laid upon him and by his wounds we are healed. As Isaiah paints a picture of the agony of the, of the cross, the agony of the atonement, He says, all of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the wrongdoing of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before its shears. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation who considered that he was cut off from the land of the living For the wrongdoing of my people to whom the blow was due. He was cut off because of the sin of the people. The the affliction that came upon him was for the sin of all who would believe. For the sin, as we've been going through Titus, and Brother Jono has taught us about the first pastoral lesson being election, for the sin of the elect, as the people who awaited his arrival looked on and cheered. And his grave was assigned with wicked men. He was crucified between two thieves. Yet he was with a rich man in his death. He borrowed Joseph's tomb. Because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. But the Lord desired to crush him, causing him grief. It pleased the Father to crush him. As he stood as an offering for sin. If he renders himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days. But he's in the midst of crucifixion. 
we catch a glimpse of the resurrection and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hands as a result of the anguish of his soul. He will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many. For he will bear their wrongdoings. So they look. A virgin will conceive. He'll he'll be God with us. He'll be called mighty God, the prince of peace. The increase of his government will will have no end uh, uh, and peace. And yet he'll be afflicted and suffer and be pierced and crushed. Not by man, but by the Father. The mystery of how all of these prophecies and hundreds of others could come together in one man. How Israel would be saved. And to get to the point of Paul's mystery revealed unto the Gentiles, how would the nations be saved? What price could be given for the sins of the world? Who would this man be? He would be fully God and fully man. Born of Mary as God with us. He had been in the beginning with God and was God, John 1.1. 1, 1. So how was that revealed? Well, we've already left the cat out of the bag. The the mystery was revealed both in Christ, but more so than that, it was revealed by Christ. 1 Timothy 3.16, Beyond question, great is the mystery of godliness. He who was revealed in the flesh, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, John 1 again, was vindicated in the Spirit as He was raised from the dead. Seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. Born, lived, died, rose again, ascended into heaven. It is in Jesus there is found the riches of glory found in this mystery. In whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Colossians 2, 3. That the Gentiles, just as the Jews... Now have this hope, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Every now and then I give you some softball questions. You don't have to answer out loud. Welcome to, what is the hope of glory? It's Christ in you. We'll turn that around. Therefore, Christ in you is the hope of glory. The expectation of of splendor, the assurance of future glory. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of His calling, what are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints. Ephesians 1, 18. To finish this thought, let's look at verse 28. We proclaim Him. We publicly proclaim Christ And what he has done. We could very easily say here, as Paul has already said, preach the word. Preach Christ. Admonishing every man. It's a warning against wrongdoing. Teaching every man. Instructing every man. With all wisdom. Or we could say in All wisdom, the spiritual wisdom that we spoke about in verse 9 of chapter 1. Christ in us, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, being found in Him and through the ministry of the Spirit, He in us. Unto the Gentiles then, this, this mystery revealed means we have an eternal, unchanging Hope. We've already spoken about that word hope in the past. It is an assurance, a solid expectation of what is to come. To use a familiar passage, in the hope of eternal life which God who cannot lie promised long ages ago but at the proper time manifested even His word 
in the proclamation of God our Savior. Titus 1, 2 and 3. So we, we look and we have this unchanging hope. Not just a hope. I would say hope, hope, hope. Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel, Colossians 1.5. Being redeemed by Christ, if you have heard him proclaimed, as verse 28 says, and believed, that's hope for eternity. It's the first hope. Just as you know how we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each of you as a father would his own children so that you would walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. 1 Thessalonians 2, 11 and 12. Being cleansed, sanctified, conformed into his image through admonishing and teaching. Something about sanctification, something about being conformed to the image of Christ, something about being led by the Word of God into conformity to what God has spoken that brings a further assurance of eternal hope. There's hope, hope. We have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, Christ in us, the Holy Spirit of promise who is given as a pledge of our inheritance, Ephesians 1. Upon, until the day when every believer is presented complete, as Paul says here. Or when Christ presents us holy, blameless, and beyond reproach. Chapter 1, verse 22. When the future hope of glory becomes a present experience of glory. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with Him in glory. Colossians 3, 4. This is the mystery revealed unto the saints of Christ, revealed unto the elect of Christ. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on Him. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved, Romans 10, 12 and 13. His mystery, His kingdom, His church, where Jew and Gentile are grafted into one body through the salvation only found in Him. He brings both the glory itself and the future hope of glory. The entirety of that future glory is wrapped up in His person and work. Going back to the introduction where we said we we can suffer for a message, we can carry a message, we can steward a message, we can humbly be servants, but if we miss Christ as the sinner, miss the gospel as foundational, I would even add here, the clearly divided and applied Word of God. We've missed it all. His kingdom is not about, not even about the knowledge that we possess in our head. It's not about the ground beneath your feet, but it's the spirit within your heart. One is either saved and a part of His kingdom or they are not. That is the mystery. The mystery was revealed to those who are His. The mystery was revealed to those whom the Father has given to the Son. This mystery that salvation no longer belonged to primarily the Jews, but goes unto the Gentiles as well. And that salvation is found in Jesus Christ. And lastly, as we finish this section, we see Paul's motivation. We start with, so that we may present every man complete in Christ. So we look at that last line of verse 28 again. Complete, mature, fully developed, literally perfect. 
So we'll ask some more questions. Three this time. To whom does this development happen? How does this development happen? Remember, complete means fully developed. And where does this development happen? The who is to believers, those who have the hope of glory. Who has any hope, let alone the hope of future glory, except those who believe in Christ and are born again? So how does this happen? The Word of God. We are made complete. We are brought to maturity. We are fully developed by the admonishing and teaching and proclaiming of the Word of God. Next, where? In the church. Paul writes this letter, verse 1-2, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae. There may be someone somewhere who would say, now, now, brother, you're reaching here. How are you tying this into the local church? Well, if Christ died for the church, I think it's more than fair for me to tie all theology back to the local church. We've heard Brother Jono and Brother Jeff say it this way, all theology is local church theology. Next we see in chapter 2, verse 1, as we walk through this, as a, see how I'm tying this back to the local church. On your behalf, he says, those in Colossae, and for those who are in Laodicea, that's another church. Verse 2, that your hearts may be encouraged having been knit together in love. Knit together with who? People out there somewhere in some unseen universal church? Or you, as you sit on your couch, being knit together with love, with who, as it's just you and your Bible under a tree, which seems to be so popular? Or knit together in love with members of a local church? Who is it? Or verse 3. These papers are really wanting to stick together. Verse 4, actually. So that no one will delude you with per persuasive arguments. What is the best way to not be deluded? To not be tricked? To not be manipulated? If you have issues, if you have problems, if you have struggles, if you have something that you've heard or read or watched that you're not quite sure if it's right and it's just you thinking about it. If it's just you battling against a sin, if it's just you with a question, if it's just you without understanding, well, it's a perfect way to be deluded. But the best way to not be deluded is to be surrounded by a healthy, biblical church. Something that I wrote down on the 24th as I read through Proverbs 24, and I, I really do try to follow through with the proverb of the day. Don't always do so well with following through with the proverb of the day. But on the 24th, I managed it. For by wise guidance you will wage war. And in an abundance of counselors there is victory. Verse 6. Or as he says in verse 5. Rejoicing to see your good discipline. Your order. Your arrangement. Priests who served in the temple served according to division or order. They had assigned tasks at assigned times. How may one be orderly and arranged without being part of a place that's orderly and arranged? How do I orderly arrange myself with my Bible on my couch? Around what? For what? And with who? How do I orderly arrange in a place of madness? How do I orderly arrange in a, med a mega church that might as well be called Six Flags Over Jesus? It cannot be done. The only way I can orderly arrange is I'm surrounded by a group of people that have had the mystery of Christ revealed to them in salvation. They have been born again. They have come together and said the Christ is the focal point. The gospel is foundational. The word of God is going to be central. 
Now I can orderly arrange myself. Or to just use what we have worked through in this one section. Paul suffered for the church, verse 24. He was a servant, steward, preacher of the church, verse 25. His proclamation, his preaching was both to and for the church, 26 through 28. His motivation, for the church, chapter 2, verses 2 through 5. Christ is glorified in the salvation of his church and he is glorified in and by his church. We can without hesitation say, as Paul is writing to Colossae to confront error and to reveal the truth, that he longs for them to be healthy church members. So with the conclusion of this section, let's get real practical. To be saved and see true completeness, true maturity, what is it that's necessary? As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Proverbs 27, 17. Make sure I quoted that right. Yeah, 27, 17. To be knit together in true abiding love. This isn't a passing, I love you brother. This is in a small group when a brother has a struggle that you rally around him. This is the small groups that come together every time there's a new baby born. And I experienced this a few months ago. And the outpouring of love in practical ways is clear. When people show up to your home with food, more so than that, when they show up a few weeks before the baby's born with a bunch of diapers because you're going to need them, and then some. To truly mine the depths of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, to be safe from delusion and being taken captive by persuasive arguments, I can be convinced if I'm my own sounding chamber and I'm the only one that I'm listening to. But it always seems to be as we go verse by verse and line by line that where it is we find ourselves in the moment, how often have you experienced this? Brother Jono gets up on Sunday morning, opens his Bible, and some bit of practical application from his sermon hits you right where you live. It's hard to be deluded in a spirit-empowered Christ-centered church to be safe from delusion and being taken captive by those persuasive arguments to see good discipline and have the stability of faith requires community it requires like-minded community and that requires a regenerate body of believers and I would say the healthier the better so as to say we've not arrived but if this is our focus, we'll keep heading that way. Ephesians 4, 12 and 13, having said, He gave some apostles and prophets and pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of of Christ I can share some of my testimony here as to the Reader's Digest version of how we arrived here is I found myself realizing I didn't know anything and I didn't know what I didn't know I could read my Bible and I could say, okay, I agree with this and I agree with this and I agree with this and I agree with this. I don't know how to do any of that because I've never seen anybody do it. But there's somewhere out there that's seeking to do that. Not perfectly. I've always jokingly told people if I knew of a perfect church, I wouldn't go because I'd just mess it up for everybody else. To use a familiar example, Titus 1.5 of to use Titus again, 1.5. If the health of local churches was not important to the Lord's plan, would Paul have told Titus, set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city? He could have simply said, Titus, you just encourage individual Christians. Titus, won't you write a blog while you're there? Titus, you know... What Crete really needs is a good parachurch organization. 
Crete just really needs a mission board. They need a state office of something. But instead, he told him to set the churches in order by prim- primarily by appointing elders. Now, there, there was, may have been some room in Crete for some bloggers and some organizations and some podcasters. In fact, there's nothing wrong with any of those things. They can be good in most of the time. Uh, sometimes they are. We'll start with the faithful expositor and work our way down from there. In fact, they can be God-glorifying and helpful. But without a healthy local church, and I was stretching for some analogies here, and you may be able to tell it when I give it to you. It'd be like building a radio shack, and I understand that's not a thing anymore. Um, But everyone mostly should know what I'm talking about when I say radio shack. It's like building a radio shack in Amish country. There may be a lot of things in there that are helpful, but without electricity, they're not going to do you a bit of good. It's useless without the depth and vigor, the biblical truth, the community and the discipleship, the obedience to Scripture that is found in the local church that is rightly arranged and guided by the Word of God. The Christian world today looks like the shelf behind the counter of the pharmacy. You've got a little pain, we've got a pill for that. We've got 97 different painkillers we can give you. Heaven forbid you try to figure out the source of the pain and do something about it, we can just mask it. Or a better better illustration may be the vitamin and supplement aisle at your local grocery store. If you've already got a healthy diet, balanced and nutritious, as I'm sure we all do, I'm sure we all eat perfectly, you might see some benefit from a good multivitamin. But where's the lion's share of the benefit going to come from? The main course, what you're already consuming. This being tied to a healthy local church, participating and being faithful. More benefit is seen here than all of the supplements in the world. On the other hand, there's the one who attends five conferences a year, reads 35 books by the best-selling authors, listens to 20 hours of Christian music every week, listens to a thousand sermons but rarely attends the local church can't be bothered to plug in faithfully to a small group, ignores the call that goes out to serve, willfully gathers with with those in grave error. I would emphasize the word grave error. It's like this, to continue the vitamin analogy, it's like having a whole stack of vitamins on the back of your bathroom vanity. And breakfast, lunch, And dinner is brought to you by a little girl named Debbie and Monster Energy. Take all the vitamins you want. It's not going to end well. It's not going to turn out good. Try to supplement a box of honey buns every day with whatever you want. It's not going to work. On the local church front, Don't take it from me, take it from Crete. They had a bunch of stuff, but they didn't have healthy churches. And Paul says, this is a problem. Titus, go straighten this mess out. To bring it home, when you have an army of small group leaders, a faithful deacon body, a pastoral staff in Brother Jono and Brother Ryan and Brother Tyler, A multitude of other fellow believers who will rejoice to see your good discipline, to use verse 5 again, and the stability of your faith in Christ. Don't trade the meat and three for a honey bun and being a Flintstones kid. And I'm thinking I was hungry when I was working on this part of the sermon. But come and eat. Come and sit under the word. I know I'm preaching to the choir on Wednesday night. 
But come and eat, come and sit under the Word, come and participate in small groups, come and do what is fundamental and foundational. Come let that be primary and see anything outside of that as a lovely occasional blessing, but don't let it become a curse as it replaces the primary thing. Don't try to supplement your way into health. And just so you know, and I don't believe that you think that, but just so you know, this isn't jumping up and down on a soapbox. And I could jump up and down on the soapbox because of what this, this principle has been in my life. But it both ties in with the end of this section. How, how is it that we're knit together in love? Well, we've got to rub shoulders with one another. How is it that not just being knit together in love, how do we obtain all the wealth that comes, comes from understanding? Knowing the, the true knowledge of God's mystery that is Christ Himself, we have to hear the Word expounded. How do we avoid delusion? By having a multitude of counselors. We rightly order ourselves. We see good discipline. We become stable in the faith, which is such a rarity. Even amongst true believers. We all know those that the best of our knowledge lets us know that this is a, this is a brother. This is a sister. And yet it seems every breeze that blows tosses them around to and fro. It's all the spiritual honey buns. Never sit down and have a solid meal. But this also ties in also with the end of this section, but it's a segue into the next. Chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. Therefore, if you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, having been firmly rooted and now being built up in Him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed. Instructed where? The local church. Being built up how? With fellow believers together as members of a body. So we have the revealed mystery of the gospel. The redemption that is found in Christ. The riches of grace. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And I think Paul really meant that he didn't say a hope of glory. Do you possess such hope? And I'm, I'm not talking about a moment in yesteryear where someone told you that you possessed such hope. But do you possess, when you say, can you say Christ in you the hope of glory and rest in that hope? Can you build a life around that hope? Does that hope drive you to a church to build a life around the local church? We, all, we know way too well. Why is it that we stress the local church? Well, if Christ died for it, it must be important. And if so, if we can stake our life on that hope, do we have a God-glorifying goal and motivation? To see hearts knit together in love, uh, attaining to all the wealth that comes from full assurance. To see good discipline and the stability of faith. If so, it begins in justification. It begins in being born again. It, it Coming to faith in Jesus Christ. And then it's lived out within the bounds of the local church. Until the day that the, the hope of glory the expectation of glory becomes the experience of glory. But there, there is no experience of glory without the hope of glory. And that hope of glory is polished and made all the more real by the local church. Lord, as we have 
looked at two things that we believe to be absolutely fundamental to our faith. The gospel of Christ and his local church. I pray that not only would you knit us together in love, not only would you give us full assurance, continue to give us good discipline and stability of faith, continue to enrich us, but Lord, remind us of that fundamental thing as we've expressed here tonight as the hope of glory in the local church. Remind us that all that we organize around those two things, it is the redemption that is found in Christ and the being a faithful part of His bride that assembles locally. And Lord, we ask this in His very name. Amen.